couple raised hands did not get a shirt yet. Okay. Uh, you were small, though, right? We ran out of smalls. <laughs> well, we'll have to, we're going to order some more, though, so we'll order them and mail them on, and I'll just I'll take a list. Who else do we got left? Uh, Pete Wood, where? Oh, hey. All right. Joel, you've got what size? Uh, unfortunately, not tall. Large is fine? All right. Large and? Okay. Okay, I guess we'll start the lightning talks. Let me, uh, there we go. Hello. All right. Awesome. So I'm going to kick off Lightning Talks. Uh, my name is Calvin. I wanted to let everyone know about some cool tools we've been using or been working on using at uh, Six Feet Up, which is Vagrant. Who here is using Vagrant already? Okay, so we got a few people who already are starting to use Vagrant. If you aren't using Vagrant, you need to go to this web page right now and then check out the documentation about why Vagrant. Because actually, Vagrant's pretty awesome. So what is Vagrant? If you ever had the problem of you're developing on your local machine and then you go to deploy to production and all of a sudden things don't match and you're like, stuff's failing, you don't know why, it's because the environments weren't the same. You had you know, differences, different dependencies, the setup was wrong, wrong version of the databases, uh, all these kinds of like things can kind of pile up if you aren't using the same tools in both places to deploy your sites. So Vagrant actually allows you to run uh, kind of disposable virtual machines on your local machine that can match the target environment. So like we deployed a FreeBSD a lot or to Ubuntu or to CentOS. I can actually spin up a machine on my local machine and it's, really, it's very transparent to me and you make sure all the dependencies are installed so it matches exactly my target environment where I'm going to be launching uh, my actual site. So if I'm doing Plone or Pyramid or any of those kind of apps, uh, you can use Vagrant to ensure this kind of stability between the various environments. So it encourages developers to then work locally, uh, use your own tools. Another nice thing about Vagrant is you'll actually be able to use your own editors on your Mac, edit files on your Mac, and then run those files in your VM uh, just as if you were running them on the server someplace. So let me just kind of show you real quick. Again, it's, it's vagrantup.com. It uses uh, a couple different virtualization technologies. The main one most people probably use with it is VirtualBox. Another nice thing about it is it keeps that environment the same between if I'm working on a Mac, you're working on Windows, somebody's working on Linux, they all run the same commands, they all use their own tools, so there's a lot less confusion when it gets to getting a new person spun up and actually uh, being productive on your project is, is probably one of the biggest benefits here. So you can download VirtualBox, you can download Vagrant, and actually to get started it is very, very simple. Uh, you can you see right here I've got, my, let me make this a little bigger. Why it's showing up 10 times, but the uh, basic command is vagrant init, and then you can actually pass it a, a specific uh, machine if you want it. So in this case, I'm going to make a Ubuntu Trusty 64 uh, VM. So what that did is it actually created in this directory a, a vagrant file for me. This vagrant file basically is a descriptor. Kind of think about it as build out for your VMs. Uh, you put into it how you want it configured, number of CPUs, amount of RAM, uh, if you want additional disks spun up inside of it, uh, you can use a, what's called a provisioner to actually install dependencies. So in our case, we use Salt, but it also supports Puppet, Chef. Uh, you can use shell scripts for provisioners. Uh, you can write provisions right into the Vagrant file if you want. So it's very flexible when it comes to provisioning. And to actually get a VM uh, running, you just type Vagrant up. It actually imports. Oh, maybe I'm misspelling it here. Do a vagrant init, and then vagrant up. There we go. <clears throat> In this case, it's using the, the base base box. So you've got tons of libraries of boxes. So if you're using OpenBSD, FreeBSD, X number of Linux, you know, distributions, they've got boxes already pre-made for those things. Or you can even roll your own boxes. So if you actually had a custom environment where you're running some OS or some 
special kernel or needed to have some kind of special modules already installed, you can do that. Uh, the Vagrant has gone ahead and created a new virtual machine, started it up, and it's all running in the background right now. And so it's running headless mode. If I type Vagrant SSH, I get dropped right into a CentOS 6.5 machine in this case. So it's all up and running. If I didn't like what was going on, I can type Vagrant destroy, and it'll actually just blow away the whole machine, and I can start over clean. So again, it kind of gets you that reset button. So if you mess stuff up, you're not sure what's going on, you can do a Vagrant destroy, blows the whole thing away, and you get it all set back up. So I actually set up a Vagrant using clone 5 over here. That was really small. That's, uh, so in this case, I'm working on my local file system. I'll show you. Uh, this is a uh, sublime text. So I've got a uh, folder structure here on my Mac. It's got a build out configuration in it. And I'm going to, basically I've got clone 5 uh, spun up on my local machine. As I make changes to this file, so for example, if we go to 5-release, if I made this, oops, hello. Is that, is that the end or one minute? We didn't warn you, but you can have 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> well, the basics of this is, uh, from my Vagrant, I can actually like run build out. This actually does, it goes into the Vagrant machine, runs the build out in the Vagrant machine, and gets everything set up for me. I'm still on my Mac. Uh, and then I can go back. You can see that this is the actual VM running in the background over here. So as soon as the build out finishes, and like I said, if I was able to, if I changed any files, like for example, if I open up this file and added a line and saved it, the, uh, that just synced the files from my local machine into the VM to make sure everything goes. And then you end up with a running clone 5. So, thanks. Too much blah blah. Oh, I still got, hello. <laughs> the uh, instant critique. The so next, Christina, whenever you're, when we're getting close to the end, you can just come on up if you have anything to set up. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Come on. This is the hard part. <laughs> Why is it you? <laughs> Why is it me? <laughs> just. Try to use your regular machine here, actually, you know. I swear I think so. I mean, you get it set up. That's kind of wrong. Al, would you mind maybe we could get Christina to come up in the meantime? Christina, do you want to come up and while these guys are setting up, you can do your thing? Yeah, good, good idea. I'll just pass her this. Oh, I get the microphone. Um, hi, I'm Christina McNeil. I just want to let everyone know over the next three days, the marketing and communications sprint will be working on the content for Plone.com. Um, on the sprints page for the symposium, there's a link to the Trello board that has the case study, some of the case studies that we'll be working from. Um, if you have like a quarter of a brain, that's all you need. Uh, I don't care whether you can write, if you can speak, I can write for you. Um, so it would be great if you have any interest whatsoever, uh, if you could take a little bit of time and, and stop by and help out, that would be great. Thanks. What? Uh, this is not going to go. It's not going to go? It's still your mouse. What, what is the problem? I don't know. Well, we're waiting for, oh, actually, uh, how are you doing? You still, do you want Ross to go up next? Go ahead. I'll, I'll try to. Ross? If you're ready, well, let's just turn, turn off your, turn this off. Wow, you have to turn this off. Thank you. All right. Oh. Oh, no. Turn it back on. Sorry. 
Oh, that's, this the, is the, that's the browser, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who says lightning cannot strike twice or three times even? Okay, so I'm gonna go to my website. Uh, for those of you that were not here yesterday, I was trying to articulate the, the point that says that I'm trying to build a community portal that in the Ro city of Rochester, Minnesota, because we're launching a major initiative, so to enable the various groups in town to collaborate. So I was about to demonstrate this website. So kind of uh, go back and sit here to show you a little bit about, again, repeat what I said about the Destination Medical Center, which is a, an idea that says uh, the state of Minnesota is now launching a thing that intended to bring the Ro Rochester community to, uh, to, to add 35,000 new jobs. And through $7 billion of investment between Mayo Clinic and the private industries, as well as some public money being spent. So now that we have this initiative going on, there's a lot of social groups, uh, the nonprofit segments that worry about, are we addressing all the right problems? Therefore, I'm building this website. The intention is that you can come here to go to the community portal to to discover the way that I designed this, this, page, this page is that this column here represents all the community problems that faces. I call them uh, growth challenges and gaps. Okay, so these are problem areas. And this set of groups that are working together, some of them intentionally, some of them are not intentionally. What I like to do is bring a focus within these various groups of people that may and might, may not be intentionally working together. I want them to be aware that you, these groups here can now address all the problem, community problem, and then produce some results here, okay? So that's that design this particular page. And the product I use to construct this page as well as some of the underlying content is Plumino, uh, which is a, another way to create content. And I use uh, the, the uh, uh, your lineage, okay, and, and a number of other things as well. Now, what, a little bit of explanation about these three columns. These are just collectives, I call them. In other words, they are loosely coupled groups that may, 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 not, may or may not be aware of each other. They just kind of, they're not 501 c 3 They get together, do work on things. For example, a company planning group a notion that says people are getting together to try to compare the plans. Okay. So let me just show you a little bit about here. Okay. Some example of some of the gaps that the community faces. For example, affordable housing that we're not uh, we potentially, because of the global population, there may not be affordable housing. So now link, I click that and launch into a, a gap form that this particular form is built by Plamino. I'm not going to demonstrate Plumino here, and they can build this form quite easily. And if you also wanted to see more in terms of more items, these I'm just showing. This is a portlet here, by the way. Plumino has a way to build plot portlet, and portlets now can be embedded into uh, uh, content wells, wells content port, port, portlet manager. So now you can go here and, and in fact, even click on read more items, and, and if I log in, I can see more. I'll just demonstrate the uh, logging in by guess. So from here, I can see I ought to be able to. OK, thank you. See, now, now I can have this page as demonstrate show okay, the idea that you have com community have conversations about what kind of problems are going on. People are talking about some problems. From a workflow standpoint, conversation can turn into requirement. There are some up they are requiring spon sponsorship. Others requirements have already got sponsored, they identified here. And from requirement, you can actually project, okay? So there are some projects that are in various phases. Uh, the way that you be, I view it is some are ideas, some are concept phase, a plan phase, and become more developed, become real. So this we actually 
kind of models the faces here. So you can now track projects that way. You know, what is the, the diversity arts? You know, for example, what's cultural exchange with China? These are actual real projects that are in the works. Within the community, some are intentional, some are conceptually. So, okay, I'm done. So basically, I've demonstrated the community portal. The idea is I want to bring Plong into the mindset, mind share of community. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about, whoa, loud, um, a package I uh, built to uh, help with uh, upgrading uh, generic setup profiles called collective.upgrade. Um, if you've uh, ever been in this state, we just updated to Plone 5, and I have an add-on installed. Um, this is the kind of situation that it's meant to help with. Um, you can do this manually, obviously, through the web, um, but collective.upgrade gives me a way, oh no, I'm sorry, I need to demonstrate one more thing. Um, we're going to get to a broken upgrade step here. So, um, oh, I have PDB debug mode installed, so it'll stop. But um, if you've ever done this before where you have a very long upgrade step and then uh, somewhere in the middle of it, uh, and then somewhere after that, there is an error in another upgrade step and you have this long iteration cycle trying to get the upgrade to work, um, why aren't you going? Go. Um, you, it's a very frustrating process, takes a long time to debug. Um, so uh, collective upgrade provides a uh, help, helpers that you can use, but it also provides a, a script that you can add to your build out. And first of all, it'll try to run upgrades. Um, and it'll give you a debug prompt at it, so you don't, no web needed here. Um, but more importantly, it goes through and automatically upgrades the portal first, and wherever it reaches, wherever it reaches a new profile version, it'll commit, if I can find that. Um, oh, I don't have it debug turned on, but it's committing after each upgrade, so when it finishes upgrading CMF clone, um, that's now done. Um, and <laughs> what's that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I'll have to read that later. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I'll, I'll prove to you that the portal is upgraded. In theory, come on. There, it's upgraded. Uh, my add-on has proceeded through the first upgrade step, which works, and it's now stuck at this one. And if, now if I, uh, if I fix it, um, you know, I can finish the upgrade. So that's collective.upgrade. It also includes a number of helper steps, uh, you know, or functions for writing upgrade steps, including some to clean up broken objects, the dreaded P4A situation. If this add-on is included, experimental.broken, my best package name ever. Um, it actually fixes uh, interface handling and component registry stuff so that the site will continue to work with, with interfaces whose classes have been removed. Um, and then if you use the collective to upgrade, uh, upgrade step for cleaning up broken objects, it'll actually get all of them out of there. Um, 
This is the broken interface handling that, in my opinion, should be in zope.interface and isn't. Uh, I've tried to get the bits of this. If it's merged into zope.interface, this package goes away. Um, but in the meantime, you can use this package. I should probably remove the warnings. I've used it in a number of different sites and never had any problems. Um, but if people give me feedback that it's working for them and has worked well over time, I will remove the warnings, I promise. Um, but the warnings are very scary. They tell you not to use it. Because <laughs> this was deep messing when I did it. So that's about it. I have to read my tweets now. And it worked, Sally, huh? There it goes. All right. All right. I'm Chris. I'm from Purdue. I'm not talking about Plone or anything related, but there was a conversation yesterday about accessibility, and I wanted to show off a tool that we're using within the College of Engineering called Site Improve. Um, it gives you great, it basically scans all your pages and gives you uh, weekly reports. It also has a nice graph to let you chart your accessibility progress. So this is back in December when we first started. And you can see we have around a million or so accessibility issues uh, up till now. We're at significantly less, 350,000. So we've been working really hard. A lot of these things have to do with templating. And so when you make, of course, you know when you make the change in the template, it affects a number of pages. Um, we can create subgroups and assign people to those groups. And within our group, the Engineering Computer Network, we're actually doing really well. We're pretty much almost done. So we started out around 70,000 or so. And now we have like 70 left. 70 issues, and we're 100% web accessibility compliant. Um, it also has quality assurance tools to check for broken links and misspellings, and it, of course, is scanning these pages um, every five days. And so if there's a new broken link that pops up, uh, like, for example, the graduate school at Purdue completely changed their website, so we had a whole bunch of broken links we had to go fix. Um, that's probably still included in that number, but I don't edit those pages. <laughs> It's not my job. <laughs> um, and then you can, of course, scan things. So when you look at your list of broken links, you can see how often something was clicked. So if it's a more popular link, more popular page, you can see how often it was clicked and, and be able to do that. It also does scan PDFs and checks a certain amount of accessibility issues in PDFs, um, as well as broken links within PDFs. Um, lastly, it does have some analytics features that are similar, a little bit more advanced than what Google Analytics can do for you. Um, you can do behavior track, tracking and show user journeys. So picking an entry point within the site and figuring out where they go from there, uh, knowing, being able to tell someone, well, your page really isn't important because no one's seen it in the last three months. So do we really need to keep this content? Um, that kind of thing. How much time do I have left? You've got like two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. Um, so you can, as, as this is kind of working down, it'll 
let you see, you know, show where, where people went. Whoops. And then you can jump to a page specifically from there as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of it. The last thing I want to talk about was this thing that I've been involved with for seven years called the Mario Marathon. It starts this Friday, and we'll be streaming. So if you want to take a break during the sprints, go to mariomarathon.com. You can watch us play all the Super Mario video games from Friday 11 until probably sometime on Tuesday. So we'll be doing that, and you're welcome to you know, tweet to us and get on IRC and chat with us as well. So, all right, thanks. Oh. I, I should mention, we're doing this as a fundraiser for a children's charity, so there's a reason behind the madness. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. Who's green? <coughs> ah, okay. Okay. Who here is doing add on development for Plone? Really good. How many of you are actually following the documentation style guide, documentation style, uh, style guide for your add ons? Like how a readme should look like and all the stuff? <laughs> bad, 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 bad. bad. <laughs> But I mean, since we are working on documentation quite a bit the last couple of months, we thought about exactly that problem and we came up with Mr. Gutenberg. We figured out developers don't like to write documentation, so we were thinking about a way to help them and actually Mr. Gutenberg will help you. Mr. Gutenberg is a build up receipt. Oh. It's a build up receipt which you basically hook up into your build out and then Mr. Gutenberg will check if we have, for example, a readme. If we have a readme, it will fetch the readme and build from your readme and all the information in your setup PI Sphinx documentation. For example, this is, uh, as you can see, the GitHub from Mr. Gutenberg. Looks like quite boring. And if you run it, it will look like that at the moment. So basically, it fetches version number, author number, author name, all the stuff from the setup PI and will fetch the readme because I have a readme and then uh, building a documentation. And it's also really easy to hook up your own theme if you have a company theme for Sphinx or whatever. And um, at the moment it's pretty much work in progress because I suck at Python. I do other programming languages. <laughs> so we are looking basically for persons for, as volunteers with a bit more Python knowledge than me to actually make the first official release at the end of the sprints. So that's basically all. with 
be screen. Well, uh, Brandon's setting up. I wanted to remind you, um, I had written it on the board before, but if you could email me your slides, so nuyen at uwash.edu, please. Oh, that's super small. Aha. Is that good? Everybody can see it? Do what? Microphone, yes, 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 yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> awesome. Everybody hear me? Cool. So I want to just uh, tell, tell people about uh, something kind of new and build out, but it's uh, build out meta recipes, which is a recipe that can build you build out parts. Uh, so uh, whoever, for people who don't know, I, I host a lot of clone sites. And in my config, I have just a, a list of the sites that are supposed to be in this Zope instance. And if you run a lot of clone sites, you run into this crazy connection limit in Zeo server that it's hard to debug because it doesn't write it to the log. But so you end up having to basically carve up your Zeo server processes into one, one for every site. So you could take this list that I've got here of all the sites that are supposed to be in the Zeo server. And the meta, the meta recipe is just a recipe. Uh, has a little init method, has, has the uh, update, and, the, uh, um, update and, and install methods, but the real meat of it happens up here. So we write a little helper function called add section that lets you push build out parts into your build out. And so you could iterate over that list of sites and start substituting by name for each site. You build a Zeo server part. So down here, Code's kind of a little wonky there, but uh, so for, for each section, you can build a Zeo server part for every site in there, and it does a little bit of name substitution, and you get a whole bunch of scripts in your bin directory that's uh, an individual control script for every site, every a pack script for every site, a backup script for every site, and then you can just build meta scripts, basically, that call all these scripts so you can start them all up and shut them all down. And to use it to actually use this in your build out, you just make a part. Um, that uh, calls the recipe and it passes it the, the, the list of, of sites in the site config and, and you get back a whole bunch of Zeo server parts. So this is kind of a really powerful way to, to be able to, to write parts from parts uh, if you've got this sort of need. So if you don't know about meta recipes, that's, they're there, they're there built out. I think they're rather, rather new. So, but it work, it's working great for us. Cool. All right, barring anybody else, I think we're done for lightning talks, so we will set up for the next set of talks, please. Thank you. <laughs>